The day was November 18th, 2012, and out came a group of three men dressed in all black to lay out Ryback on the 2012 installment of Survivor Series. Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns made an immediate impact on the wrestling landscape and WWE changed forever. Over the coming years, these three men would become some of the biggest stars in the company and have carved out successful careers for themselves ever since, whether that be in WWE or somewhere else in the world. So let's take a look at the rise of quite possibly the best stable in WWE history. Let's talk about all our guys individually first before we get to them as a stable. Starting off with Seth Rollins. Rollins was signed with WWE Developmental FCW after making a name for himself on the indie scene as Tyler Black. Rollins would stay in FCW until FCW was rebranded into NXT and NXT now became the developmental brand. Rollins would go on to win the Gold Rush Tournament and become the first ever NXT champion. Moving over to Roman Reigns, his case was a little different. Reigns was an ex-football player who had family ties to WWE and found his way into FCW and NXT as well. For Dean Ambrose, this guy had a pretty good following because he had some pretty crazy matches as a part of CZW and caught WWE's eye, resulting to him being signed in 2011. All three of these men had so much talent on their own. Reigns being a physically imposing powerhouse, Rollins being the high flyer, and Ambrose had a ground and pound style of his own. Singularly, these guys were great, but when put together, these guys were phenomenal, and that's just what happened at Survivor Series 2012. In the middle of a triple threat match between John Cena, Ryback, and CM Punk, three men appeared dressed in all black. They put Ryback through the announce table which led to CM Punk retaining his WWE Championship. The next night, the group established themselves as the SHIELD and said their mission was to rally against injustice. Over the coming weeks, the trio would interfere in CM Punk's matches and attack names such as Randy Orton and Ryback. The group said they were not working for Punk but out for business for themselves. These guys just look like absolute badasses and it didn't take long for them to ascend to the top of the card. The Shield had their debut match at TLC 2012 where they faced off against Ryback, Kane and Daniel Bryan in a TLC match where the group would go on to win. At this point everything had started to be established. Roman Reigns was the powerhouse, Dean Ambrose was the crazy guy who just wanted to beat the crap out of you and Seth Rollins was the brains of the operation. Following TLC, the group attacked people like Mick Foley and Tommy Dreamer. Basically, they were going after people who were adversaries of CM Punk, even though they told us they were not working for Punk. The idea at the time was CM Punk had created this group to do his dirty work for them, and he was pretending that he had nothing to do with it. The group made an appearance on NXT where Seth Rollins lost his NXT title. Some of us had forgotten that Seth Rollins was still the NXT champion at this point. Rollins lost the title to Big E and the three were officially moved to the main roster. Now I talked about Punk's denial of the Shield working for him and that's pretty important here. At the 2013 Royal Rumble, the WWE Championship match was between The Rock and CM Punk. During the title match, the lights went out and when they came back up, The Rock had been put through the announce table. The announce table spot was of course the Shield's signature spot. Following the powerbomb, Punk pinned The Rock retaining the WWE title. That's until Vince McMahon came out to restart the match. The next night, Vince McMahon told everyone he'd been shown videotape that showed Paul Heyman paying off the group to do Punk's dirty work. Now the trio was established as a credible threat. They always took out superstars backstage whenever they felt like it and there was no real answer to them. They had this pack mentality, teaming up on you to absolutely destroy you in the process. Now the shield was after the top dog of WWE and that was John Cena. A six man tag team match was set up for the upcoming Elimination Chamber. Here the trio would defeat the team of Ryback, Cena and Sheamus. This team was getting huge victories over some of the biggest names in WWE, really showing they had investment in the group. They continued feuding with Sheamus in the lead up to WrestleMania and they won their first WrestleMania match at WrestleMania 29. 
Following all of these wins, you could really see WWE had big plans for the group. Dean Ambrose became involved in a feud with United States Champion Kofi Kingston and Rollins and Reigns started to feud with Team Hell No for the Tag Team Championships. At Extreme Rules 2013, all three men captured titles on the same night. Ambrose became the United States Champion and Rollins and Reigns won the Tag Team titles. Over the coming months, The Shield continued to wreak havoc before their undefeated streak came to an end in mid-June of 2013. In the summer, The Shield had become henchmen for The Authority. Randy Orton was protected by The Shield in The Authority's quest to keep Daniel Bryan away from the WWE title and protect the face of WWE, which was Randy Orton. Rollins and Reigns lost the tag team titles to Cody Rhodes and Goldust in October after winning them back in May. At this point, only Ambrose remained champion and there were some cracks showing in the shield. Ambrose even showed off saying that he was the only one with championship gold, even though Ambrose was usually the one eating the pin. I don't think this was the proper time to split up the shield and thankfully they didn't. Later on, they went on to start a feud with CM Punk who turned babyface at this point. This led to a handicap match at TLC which Punk won due to the lack of communication in the shield. I mentioned TLC which is usually in December and now we're in December of 2013. The Shield had been around for a year now terrorizing WWE superstars and making a huge impact. We come off WrestleMania 30 and Daniel Bryan's triumph over the authority. The Shield had been very important in Randy's reign and even feuded with Bryan and Punk for a bit. Triple H had made a match for the main event between himself and Daniel Bryan for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Bryan was already injured previously after competing in two matches the night before at WrestleMania 30. At this point, The Shield was gradually in the process of a face turn and had a lot of fans behind them like I mentioned. Triple H had Bryan at his mercy and out came The Shield. The Shield lined up on one side of the ring with Kane, Randy Orton and Batista lined up on the other. Triple H tried to restore some sense into everyone by telling them this wasn't happening here. But he turned around and he was met by a huge spear from Roman Reigns and The Shield helped Daniel Bryan fend off the authority and had fully turned babyface in the process. What came next were two excellent matches between arguably the two biggest factions in WWE history. The Shield against Triple H, Randy Orton and Batista Evolution. There were so many parallels here between the two groups and this was an amazing way to sell those post WrestleMania pay-per-views in my opinion. Because after WrestleMania, there's kind of a lull period where it's just not interesting. Anyways, it was three badasses who just didn't give a damn against, well, three badasses who just didn't give a damn, but these guys were a little bit older. The Shield won both matches between the two and were put over so hard. The second match at Payback was one of my favorite tag team matches ever. There was so much nut stuff going on. At this point, The Shield was on top of the world. There was no one better, they had just defeated three of the all-time greats. That's until that one day, that one segment, June 2nd, 2014. Triple H and Randy Orton came out to confront the three members of The Shield. Triple H let The Shield know, yeah, you guys won, but there's always a plan B. And what was that plan B? Well, Seth Rollins grabbed a chair from ringside as Reigns and Ambrose move forward, Rollins stays in the back, and bang, straight to the back of Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins delivered a chair shot, and that's it. It was a long time coming, but I think this was executed perfectly. Seth Rollins batters Reigns and Ambrose with an onslaught of chair shots into an absolute pulp, and that's it. That's the end of The Shield, the most dominant and well-protected faction possibly ever. Rollins was now aligned with Triple H and The Authority. Now everything was invested in Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins was the guy, the breakout superstar, the superstar who they wanted to be the next top guy. That started at Money in the Bank 2014. Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose for that matter were involved in the Money in the Bank contract ladder match. The field also consisted of Jack Swagger, Wade Barrett, Dolph Ziggler, RVD, and Kofi Kingston. For Ambrose, this wasn't about the contract, more so for ruining the life of the absolute bastard Seth Rollins. Rollins would go on to win the Money in the Bank after Kane took out Dean Ambrose for Seth Rollins. 
This was probably the last time the Money in the Bank contract was used properly to build a new star, but that's another story for another day. Now remember, Reigns and Ambrose never had a falling out here and actually never really did in the years after. They both went their separate ways, but Ambrose just wouldn't let Rollins off the hook. He was like that obsessed girlfriend who just wouldn't let Rollins go. This heated feud culminated in a lumberjack match at SummerSlam 2014. This match was a lot of fun. It was about 15 minutes, but it had a lot of action going on. Guys just chasing one another everywhere, pure chaos, and of course, Rollins being the sneaky heel he was, cheating to win the match. At the same pay-per-view, Reigns was in a match with Randy Orton. This match was pretty solid and did a good job of giving Reigns the win over Randy and making him look strong. They were booking Reigns properly here, not the crap we'd come to get later on, but I'll talk about that in a minute. I'd say out of all of them, Rollins was developing the quickest. He just had that smug arrogance to him with the backing of the authority that was even more annoying than usual. Now Rollins and Ambrose continued to feud. At one point, Rollins curb stomped Ambrose through cinder blocks and took him out of action. That led to a Hell in a Cell match between Ambrose and Rollins, and this match was pretty damn epic. At the beginning of the match, the two fell off the side of the Hell in a Cell, and it was just an insane moment that many of us are not going to forget. The match was pretty fun, but it ended in a weird way after Bray Wyatt interfered and cost Ambrose the match. Of course, WWE has to finish off a heated feud with a bull ass finish. Rollins was the authorities guy and kinda like the spoiled little kid hiding behind his mom and dad. He was protected by them and the authority always made life hell for the baby faces. So John Cena got tired of Rollins' BS and the build for Survivor Series had begun. The story here was Cena wanted the authority to be gone because of how much they abused their power. This was a great build to Survivor Series with Rollins at the forefront once again, which was great because Rollins was presented as a star and was backing it up every time he was on the mic or in the ring. The match at Survivor Series was a really fun one with back and forth action and of course a big show heel turn. The match ended when Ziggler pinned Rollins after Sting made his debut and that was it. WWE had rid itself of the authority or so we thought. As 2014 drew to a close, Edge and Christian were guest hosting Raw. They invited Rollins to a segment on the Cutting Edge Peep Show. What a name that is. Now remember, Edge had retired at this point and we were told he couldn't take another hit or he would be paralyzed. So Rollins used that to his advantage. Rollins held Edge to the ground saying he'd curb stomp him and paralyze him unless John Cena brought back the authority. So Cena agreed and brought them back. So let's fast forward to Royal Rumble of 2015 where Reigns was basically shoved down our throats. Everyone knew Roman Reigns was going to win the Rumble and face Brock as they'd really gotten behind him. Rollins and Ambrose were organically getting their characters over whereas Roman Reigns was shoved down our throats and rejected by the WWE crowd immediately. When the shield came to an end, both Rollins and Ambrose changed their character and look but Reigns kept the vest kept the music, and apparently kept all the Salty Shield fans too. In this match, the boos rained down so loud because everyone already knew the result. When Reigns won, even The Rock couldn't save Roman Reigns from being booed out of the building. Philly hated Roman, especially because they wanted a returning Daniel Bryan to win the match. In the same pay-per-view, Cena, Rollins, and Lesnar had a triple threat match for the WWE Championship. This match was so damn good, but Lesnar would come out on top. Another amazing showcase match for Seth Rollins. I know all you guys are probably wondering what Ambrose was up to during all this, but we'll get back to him in a bit. WWE tried to fix the situation by putting Roman Reigns' WrestleMania spot against Lesnar on the line against Daniel Bryan, but Reigns would go on to win, so it really didn't fix anything. This only made his push worse as they booed him every time they heard Roman Reigns' music. The build up to WrestleMania was Brock vs Roman in the main event for the WWE Championship. Rollins was taking on Randy Orton after he betrayed the authority and Orton went full Viper mode and Dean Ambrose was competing in a ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship. Let's get on to WrestleMania 31 and see what all the fellows were up to there. 
Ambrose lost the ladder match in the opener to WrestleMania 31. Rollins lost to Orton following a curb stomp turned into an RKO. Now it was time for the main event of the show, Brock Lesnar vs Roman Reigns. This match was really hard fought and really physical, but as both men laid prone in the ring, the second coming hit and outran Seth Rollins to cash in his money in the bank contract, hitting a curb stomp on Reigns and winning the WWE title and closing the show out on top. Rollins became the first superstar to cash in his money in the bank at WrestleMania and the first member of the Shield to win a world title. This once again was executed perfectly and it made sense in storyline too because it was Rollins getting another one over on his former shield buddy. Rollins had a spectacular run in my opinion. He was the perfect heel. You just love to hate the guy. With Joey and Jamie beside him as his security guards, you just wanted to rip that stupid little blonde patch out of his hair. I'm not going to go into every single feud because this isn't a video on Rollins' title run but I'll go over some of the key feuds. Rollins had a great feud with Ambrose in the spring months. It was so perfect because a year beforehand they were fighting each other over Rollins ending the shield and now they were fighting for Rollins' title. They had a great ladder match at Money in the Bank 2015. It was just so good. Both men fell from the top with Rollins keeping the title by the hair on his chin. The summer months were approaching and SummerSlam was near once again. At this point, Rollins found himself wrestling John Cena at SummerSlam with the US and WWE Championship on the line. Rollins would win after a screwy finish, but nonetheless, Rollins had two titles. As good as his reign was, it had to come to an end and it didn't end with him actually losing the title in a match, but rather an injury. At a live event in Dublin, Rollins landed on the instep of his right knee, which caused him to relinquish the title because he needed surgery on the knee. It sucks to see such a great run from a fresh new competitor end, but we gotta move on. Since the title was now vacant, a world title tournament was set up which culminated at Survivor Series. In this tournament were both Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose. These two went on to the finals where Roman Reigns won, winning his first WWE Championship in the process. That's until Sheamus cashed in and took his moment away from him. Reigns then feuded with Sheamus for a little while before winning back the WWE title after Vince McMahon tried his hardest to put him in a storyline to kinda resemble Daniel Bryan in 2014, but it just didn't work. We all saw what they were doing, even doing something so badass like punching McMahon in the face wasn't enough to get Reigns over with us. After Reigns captured the title, everyone was still against him and I mean both the fans and the on-screen characters. The Royal Rumble match was announced and the match would be contested for the WWE Championship with Reigns starting at number 1. Again, they were trying so hard to make Reigns appeal to us, but it didn't work Chief. Triple H would go on to be the winner of that title match and the main event for WrestleMania was made. Triple H and Roman Reigns for the world title, which we all knew Roman would win. Following Roman's victory at WrestleMania, he was involved in a title feud with Styles for a bit before Seth Rollins made his grand return coming back at Extreme Rules, hitting Roman Reigns with a pedigree and holding the WWE title in the air to signify he's back. Rollins' injury was pretty well documented and when he did return, he got cheered quite a lot. And it helped that Roman Reigns was the guy on the other side because everyone likes to boo Roman. At Money in the Bank, the world title match was set between Rollins and Reigns. Meanwhile, that sneaky Ambrose was in the Money in the Bank ladder match. Ambrose won the ladder match in the opening match of the show. We'll get back to him in just a minute. In the main event, Rollins and Reigns put on a solid match with Seth Rollins finally getting his title back. That's before we heard Dean Ambrose music hit and Ambrose hit Rollins with the money in the bank and cashed in. It was complete, the trifecta. All three members of the Shield held the world title in one night, once again proving how well all these guys were built up. This was perfect as when Ambrose finally got his moment, it was Rollins who he pinned for the win. Whether or not that was WWE actually trying to do so or just a coincidence is up for debate. 
After Ambrose won the WWE title, a triple threat match was set for Battleground. This is the match we'd all been waiting for. Also, what was going on at this time was the brand split and everyone knew where they were going at this point. Reigns and Rollins were headed to Raw and Ambrose to SmackDown. Now, surely Ambrose was about to lose the title here. Many of us thought this might have been just for the sake of putting the title on Ambrose, but this wasn't the case. Ambrose won and brought the title over to SmackDown Live. Ambrose was now separated from Reigns and Rollins and was the main champion on the SmackDown brand. We all know how amazing SmackDown was in 2016 and a huge part of that was Ambrose. Ambrose's reign as WWE Champion was pretty solid until he lost it to AJ Styles at Backlash. Ambrose was great, but something about his reign just didn't do it for me. I really don't know what it is, but the reign really failed to get me behind Ambrose because it just didn't excite me that much personally. While SmackDown was killing it, Raw was left without a world champion. This led to the introduction of the Universal Championship. Seth Rollins was placed into that match and ended up losing to Finn Balor. After that, he transitioned to a feud between himself and Triple H after Triple H screwed him out of the Universal title and the Kingslayer was born. This turned Rollins babyface for the first time in his singles career. Reigns on the other hand was put into the United States Championship picture for a bit which really didn't do much for him as they had already screwed up. When a team like the Shield splits up, obviously there's that need from fans to see them reunite. And that's exactly what happened in 2017. It always sucks when these teams are reunited too quick, but this felt like the right time to put them back together. They since had another reunion at the end of 2018, but that one got a little messy when Ambrose told Roman Reigns he deserved leukemia. I'm gonna briefly talk about all these guys singularly because in the end they are one group and began together but all their paths have been different. Let's start with Roman Reigns. Reigns has been a mainstay on WWE programming and it really isn't his fault he's booked the way he is. If your boss tells you to go out there and win, you have to do what he says. It's not your fault. Reigns has won so many titles in the WWE and he just is a star now. Whether you're a fan of him or not, it's just not the same without the guy. He's overcome some real life issues with his leukemia which make him appeal to more of us I think. Next up is Seth Rollins and this guy has basically won everything there is to win. He's won the Money in the Bank, Royal Rumble and he's won every title in the WWE. When he turned babyface, he was so hot and doing so great but he led to his own demise which caused him to get booed and ruin his character himself. His ability to adapt his character has been something that made Rollins so lovable and made him a household name in the WWE. Now for Dean Ambrose. Now revisiting the Shields run, I feel like Dean Ambrose was the one guy that was kinda lost in the shuffle the most. Just when you thought they were really gonna run with the guy, they'd strip him back just a little bit. Since the split, Ambrose kinda struggled, unless he was doing something with Reigns or Rollins, although he did have some good feuds. Ambrose was the type of guy you just need to let off his leash a little bit and give him some creativity as he's proven how amazing he can be. Frustration with the company has since caused him to leave WWE and now Ambrose is with All Elite Wrestling doing some great work. It really is a shame that they didn't get behind Moxley because he really is that good. But he was always the forgotten one out of the bunch even though it looked like he would be the breakout when The Shield first made their debut. WWE did a great job of creating three separate stars from The Shield. A lot of times groups split up and just never amount to the same success they once had. But all three of Rollins, Ambrose and Reigns built up a huge following for themselves and are now the kings of the industry. The Rise of the Shield is a case of WWE doing things properly and creating new stars to supplant the old ones for the future. It's crazy that that one Survivor Series pay-per-view changed everything forever. Sorry Ryback. So that is the Rise of the Shield. Be sure to like the video, subscribe and let me know what your favorite Shield moment is down below in the comments and I will see you in the next one.